the roll call. Uh, let's start with the roll call attendance. Uh, Ralph? Ralph Domitzer here. Susan? Susan Franklin here. Francine? Francine Lyons here. Mike? Mike Dick here. And Brian Host here. Okay. So the, uh, the agenda for this evening is really for us to um, uh, cover everything that's in front of us. So it's not, it's not itemized. Um, we're, we're literally gonna go through the entire list and um, try to get this ironed out as best we can this evening. Um, recognize we may get close and not quite there or we may get there. Um, at six o'clock, uh, so we'll start with that. Um, at six o'clock, Ron Menard is gonna join us just to discuss one of the items, which is the data center. Ralph, I know you had in particular had concerns around that. I think others had some questions as well. Um, and when we have him, we'll you know, also um, press to, to, to better understand the, you know, the, the iPad number in our spreadsheet to see if there's, there's any room in that. Um, and we can also talk about the Taiwan technology exposure um, surrounding the interactive display panels. So that's at six o'clock. Um, after we, uh, you know, after Ron joins us and we get through that, um, what I'd like to suggest is if there's any time remaining, um, I'd like to give the committee an update of the discussion that took place at the select board last evening. Um, I don't know if anyone was able to catch it, but everyone should be aware of, of, of sort of what was discussed. and. Uh, the items that we're going to need to take up in the very near future, um, or at least attempt to take up. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best to bring everyone up to speed. And obviously that took place less than 48 hours in advance of this meeting. So it's not on the agenda, but I do think it's, it's, it's incredibly important that people hear about this as soon as possible. So that's, uh, that's what I think is in front of us. Um, before we dive in, does, does anyone have any thoughts, comments, suggestions as to you know, it, you know, anything else that we should 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 do or do differently in terms of tonight's agenda. Brian, I, just to clarify, does anything that you're going to tell us about what happened at the select board going to influence or color any decisions we make? I, I don't think so, because uh, virtually all of it is um, outside of, you know, what I'd characterize as the regular um, capital budget. Um, uh, appropriation process, at least in terms of the annual requests. Um, these are these are conversations about, you know, um, bigger items, permanent funding sources, you know, frankly, extra taxes or new and different taxes um, that all go, go above and beyond what really what we're going to start with tonight, which is, you know, simply prioritizing that the items that were, you know, we, we'd recommend for funding using the appropriation that we received out of the you know, out of, out of the annual levy. Okay. Um, so I, I don't anticipate any of those items would impact, you know, the, what we discussed at the front half of this meeting. That said, I think if we're, there is time at the end, we should be talking about the whole concept of special purpose stabilization yep. funds. Those last four words are in quotes. Yep, all true. Okay, with that, why don't we dive into uh, into, into this year's process? Um, uh, and, and maybe just as a starting point, Mike, if I could ask you to you know to pull up the spreadsheet, I think that's that's just probably good that we work off of that. It's it's as it's as good a guide as any. Um, and we should just chip through this and see if we can get this thing to this thing to balance. And it's going to come down to a couple of items. Um, let me start with the easiest thing, which is line 22. Michelle Leary has informed me that that uh, replacement of circuit pumps can, can come off for this year. So we can zero that. Um, and I guess I'd say every little bit counts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that brings us to 137. And hold on a second, we've got a uh, question from Mike Barkley. 
Mike, go ahead. Um, yeah, Brian, I just wanted to let you know, we just, the advisory committee just got a copy of the draft warrant. So okay. if it's helpful, I mean, pretty much everything I see on your list in the, um, in column B is on this warrant. Um, I think the only thing that's different is, um, the, uh, the pull, the new facility assessment for police and fire is also on the draft warrant, which is I, what line 30. So that other than that, everything that I see on the warrant is in your column B. Okay. And everything that's missing for the, and there's, there's nothing on the warrant that, that is uh, zeroed in our column B. Um, let's see. So I, I can quickly go down. So the 90,000 for the schools, the 52,000 for the schools, the 35,000 is there. Yeah. Um, the, um, the interactive smart panels is also there. Um, they're in there for what? 155? 155, 166. Yes. Um, yeah. the 300, as you would expect. For how, about, how about the iPads, Michael? Don't see the iPads. Okay. Um, oops, I'm sorry, I misspoke. No, the iPads are there. So yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, basically you've got all five of those items um, are in the draft warrant. Um, and then the DPW, the 300 for roads and sidewalks, the 145 for the John Deere loader, the 15,000 for facilities, the 60,000 for facilities service vehicle, the 420 for the data center, the 124 for the police cars, the 12355 for the tasers, the 75 for the new facility assessment for public safety, and then the 335 for the, the turnout gear for the fire department. Okay, so, so basically what's in the warrant is identical to you know column D. Um, D like David. Yeah. yeah. D, D yes. like David. Yes. Yes. So I, it didn't, is. I didn't hear you say the sixty thousand for the tie the retiling. Did you? That's say that the, that's I don't see that. Okay, so that's the difference. Line twenty one. So that's the only difference. Oh, okay. No, actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's all column D. No, column D okay. is all in there, including the retile. Including the retile. Yeah. Okay, and that that's a, for a total of uh, it's a total of one one seven. Is that correct? Um, I'll let, give me a second. I'll total it up. There's not a total it, line. It, it's here on the spreadsheet. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's if it's identical, then that's what it is. It's one six seven, and we've got you know two hundred thousand less than that to spread to, to actually spend. Okay, two forty six. Yeah, basically got one four seven or something of that nature. Okay, so um, I, I guess I leave it to the committee. Do you wanna focus on what we cut out of column D or do you wanna go back through it um, in some other way? I'd like to get a sense from, from our committee as to what they really feel needs to be there that mm -hmm. isn't. And so focus on these green cells. These are cells that are on the warrant, but um, right now are not in our trial for yeah. the um, our recommendations, correct. And we're about two hundred over, and two forty six, almost two fifty over. Yeah, I have to put too fine a point on it. And so I, I'd, I'd ask our our committee, um, maybe we can go around. Um, just yep. say, ask them what do they feel should be in here. And if if everyone all agrees that all these green items should be over <clears throat> uh, in our recommendations, then we need to go back to Jennifer Mullen and Chris Senior and say, okay, um, we need two hundred and forty five, forty six thousand more dollars, um, or we go underneath our threshold of a million in reserve. Yeah. So can I clarify one thing, Michael? These are your recommendations right now, I, I would say. 
In, um, in column B, yes. In column B are your recommendations. As as right. as straw yep. man, as as a point yep. of discussion. Yep. No, and I think this is this is such a great tool. Um, I really do appreciate it to kind of all mm -hmm. summarize it here so we're not flipping through papers. So this mm -hmm. is fantastic. Um, so I'll start. So I think I had already mentioned in the last call that um, first, the one item I question that I would agree to, right now I wouldn't agree to is the 420 and the IT. So I'll be looking forward to Ron's conversation at six. The two that I would, I would vote yes to that are in green. Otherwise, I think I, I would agree with your assessment, except for then the two in green under the schools. I would vote yes on those. But otherwise, I, I would agree with the rest of your assessments or uh, summary. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone want to go next? Oh, um, sure. Um, the two at the top, uh, I think I would like to hear Ron talk a little bit about the questions we have before I would opine on those. Yeah. Uh, to wonder schools that are green. Anything else? Yeah, I'm just trying to, to recall um, the conversation we had, I, I believe it was with advisory about um, funding assessment reports. Uh, I thought that there was some potential that we would not be funding assessment reports going forward or did, how did that come up, Brian? It didn't really. Okay. Well, having been to the police and fire, I mean, I, I really do think we need to evaluate that building. Um, I don't really know if waiting much long, you know, waiting any longer is, I don't know, but getting our cards on the table, I guess, with what we need to do with our buildings is kind of important for make, making future decisions. So I'm inclined to, to say yes to that one. That's the 75,000. Okay. On the assessment. All right. Anybody eager to go next? Ralph, Mike. I think Mike should. I should be. Uh, I should not. I, I'll come in at the point where you need me. But as okay. the associate, I think you guys ought to all speak first. Okay. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, I believe that we're going to be convinced by Ron when he does come here. So I would leave the four twenty for now. Um, I support your questions though, and I want everyone to be really solid with his answers. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, I certainly would put in, um, the 75 for the, uh, new facility. Um, now I'm wondering what I should do here. I'm going to, I'm going to put, um, Yes and yes. Um, that leaves about 60,000 to bring us even. So I would put back. Um, hmm. you, you lost me there. What, we need 60,000 to get to even. I thought we needed 250 to get to even. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going with my column B. So let me think. Let me think about how we're approaching this. Um, I'm, I'm looking at column B. Yeah, and I, I see right now. So I think got, everyone else is probably looking at column D. Is is everyone else looking at column D and just reconciling it, or what? Well, I think we are, but I think what Mike is saying is the delta between yeah. our balance and and the new balance with the these items included is that you know yeah. at forty. So if he says yes to the seventy five, it gives him about sixty. Is okay. that what you're saying, Mike? Yes, exactly. So if if I okay, plug it, it in here, that brings us down to sixty. Two, and then the question is, all right, what can we do on the smart panels? Um, can we go for half and put in 75 there? 
and that would bring us to a deficit of, of you know, 12,000. So I would leave off the um, iPads and I would go for um, 75,000 on the smart uh, panels. Whoops. Okay. Um, you done? All set? Yes. I didn't mean to cut you off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I'm just looking at, at column D. Um, I, I guess, you know, this may be a little bit off course, but I, I um, in, in order of priority at this point, I do not see line 21 as a priority, um, which is to retile you know, this says all classrooms. It's actually about one sixth of the classrooms. Um, and just to put that in perspective, and, and I just, to, to me, I think that's a much lower priority than, than anything else that we're discussing here, certainly including Chromebooks to the extent that they're end of life. Um, with regards to the retiling, just to refresh everybody's memory, um, we, we retiled the hallways several years ago because we had a heaving issue. Um, and that I think was a, a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, last year we appropriated a hundred thousand dollars, which was to retile all classrooms. Um, and at that time, the understanding was it was a hundred thousand dollars, and then we were done. Um, and now this this year we so we're already three or four hundred thousand dollars into the retiling of Deer Hill. Um, and you know we have a three hundred thousand dollar request in front of us that. You know, when it became evident that it wasn't going to fit, you know, it was broken into five installments of sixty thousand dollars each. So this isn't just sixty thousand dollars. This is the first of five sixty thousand dollar installments. Um, when I look at the other stuff on this list, and and recognizing that, you know, <laughs> um, at this point this is just a project overrun, and I'm assuming that they retiled the classrooms that were, you know, were actually the highest priority and in the most dire need. I, I just I wouldn't put this ahead of Chromebook or, or ahead of the iPads, for example, if in fact the iPads are end of life. I mean, if the iPads are end of life, we don't I, my my view is there's not even a discussion to be had. We don't have a choice. Um, so I, I think at, at six o'clock, you know, we need to ask Ron about about the iPads. But in terms of the stuff that's left on this list, that would be the first thing for me that I would take off, which would be these tiles. I think I think that has to be paused until there's, there's, there's room for it or until there's actually a danger. Um, Cause I, I just feel like it's, at this point it's, it's aesthetic um, and it's one fifth of the solution. So that's, that's why I'm fixated on that line. Um, I think that uh, um, I, I am in agreement with the need to figure something out on police and fire. Um, I am perplexed as to what it is that, you know, we're going to be assessing. Um, and I, I guess what I'd like to suggest is that I just turn it over to Michelle, perhaps for a, 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 for a quick update um, on a walkthrough that they did with some, you know, with some professionals of this facility and then an update uh, with regards to locations um, or the lack thereof where we could actually site another facility um, because I'm not really sure it's, well, I'm, I'm going to leave it to, to her um, to just give updates on that, and then we can revisit this this particular line item. Michelle? Sounds like Michelle may have left. Um, Susan, while we have a moment, um, I just want to go back into your column and make sure that I've got um, every green cell um, noted for how you, um, whether you recommend or not. Um, so for line five, the smart panels, are you yes or no? Yeah, I, I was holding out to hear what Ron had to say. Okay. On our questions on those two green. Okay. Ah, oh, gotcha. Okay. But and then know, on the I service. I that we were going to go back and talk about the column B ones. Um, but I, I'm, I support Brian's view on the tile as well when it comes down to how we spend the money. I think there's more pertinent things to, to focus on. Okay. And on the service vehicle for 60,000.
Yeah, um, I know that Ryan said it was a, a, a priority item for him, but then in another conversation, somebody said that it, it wasn't necessarily a priority item. So no. questions still? I, I might be able to clarify. So, so there are two vehicles on this list. Um, one is line uh, 14, Susan. Yep. Um, and I think that's the one that Brian referred to as a lower priority than the backhoe. It's a, than the loader backhoe. If, if given the choice between one or the other, um, he said we'd take the backhoe because we've got multiple utility trucks. Um, I think this this one's for Nick, and this is this is the one that's been kicking around for years. Um, in, the in terms of replacement problem. need. Yeah, the one that had transmission issue and often doesn't operate, yeah. Then I would definitely support that over classroom tile. Okay, service vehicle is yes? Yep. Okay. I would I would agree with Susan and, and Brian, the service vehicle over the tiles, retiling the classrooms. Okay. Um, let me just make sure I've got everybody. Um, Brian, your thoughts on the new facility um, assessment? That was a yes. Well, it feels like we lost Michelle. Um, and, and so, you know, unless she pipes back in or unless Chris Senior is here and can, can articulate, you know, what, or at least affirm what I heard from Michelle earlier today. Um, I think it, it's potentially impactful. The, uh, apparently Marshfield just did a, um, a new, um, uh, emergency response facility. Uh, and the, I think it was the architect and the OPM, the project manager uh, from that Marshfield project came up and looked at our facility and mm -hmm. did a walkthrough and basically said, you know, there's not much you can do here um, in, in terms of, you know, fixing the problems that you, you have in, in, in front of you. Um, you know, bigger buildings, same footprint, whatever, it was, it was pretty much no, no, no. Um, and so that really leaves us with a, you know, a, a new facility. Um, the problem is that we don't actually have a site for a new facility. So it's, it, it begs the question of exactly what are we gonna study? Um, you know, in, in terms of needs, our chief should be able to articulate it. Um, in, in, in terms of an actual facility, you, you kind of need a place to start um, in, a, in, a, in a view of what it is you want to draw. So I, I, it, this, this, this is a very real need. I think everyone's, and, and you, you can see that based on what people have articulated uh, today, but it's a real lack of clarity as to what you'd actually spend money doing. Um, until we figure out, you know, where, where we could put a new facility. So that brings you to a yes or a no at this point. Um, I, I, I guess absent a site, I, 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 I would probably be a no. Okay. Um, and Francine, what's, what's your um, take at this moment? Um, uh, I'm struggling with this one too. Okay, I'm going to put TBD. That's fine. Yeah. That's fair. That's okay. Um, Brian, on I, I, the... I guess I guess one thing I would say is if I did not have the information that I just shared with you guys, I'd be a yes on this. But based on what I heard from, you know, prior to this call, and unfortunately, I'm, you know, sharing. I, I think we these all should be turned into um, a question yeah. um, response here. We have, we have questions. Yeah. Is that fair, everybody? I think it's fair. Okay. I, mean, yeah. I, I don't think and, we should be forced to vote things that, that you know, yeah. are not resolved. I mean, we, we've got, we got plenty of funds tied up in prior appropriations that haven't been executed on. I, I, right. Susan, I see you nodding your head. Yes. Should I add? Put, uh, well, 
right. put you in that's, for that's, the same. That's new information that, that Brian has provided. It would have been great if Michelle were able to give us more, but. Okay. Does everyone agree that we all still have questions before we can really uh, wait, uh, take a recommendation vote on mm -hmm. line 30? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, line 23. Um, I still need answer from Brian. I my instinct is I'd be a, a yes. I mean, there's no question there's a need, um, and he you know has kindly deferred this at, at least a year and a half and mm -hmm. running at this point. Okay. Um, I'm going to update my votes, my um, perspective on uh, the retail to a TBD. Back down from a yes, and I'm going to um, raise my service vehicle from a no to a TBD at this point. And the reason I say that is I just want to see how everything else shakes out, particularly with um, the questions we have for Ron, because if he can free up some money, that will help decision making on other items. Yeah. So we're 250 short. We've taken out 60. Possibly, you know, possibly more. Okay. Um, realistically, um, on the retail, why don't I change that to a no uh, on me and we'll take it out. And I'm, I'm going to be working with column B as our trial column. That's where the, the changes will appear and give us a balance. And I'll, I'm going to leave column D alone as our reference. This is what okay. we're always going to go back to and, and refer to. How's that? Yeah, I think that makes sense because those are the town recommendations. We shouldn't be tinkering with them. Right. And that's, that's what they recommend. So be it, right? So we're... Mm -hmm. Uh, one other item here I still have is the smart panels. Brian, what's your take on that? My take is we piloted them, you know, we're ready to roll out. Um, if you add it, it'll, it'll put us negative one, one ten ish. <laughs> Yeah, I have a bigger number than that. So if we were at negative 246, just on the town column, right? Yeah. And we knocked out. We knocked out what? Two items, 15 for the circulator pumps. Where, uh, hold on. I, I deleted that line item. Oh, you deleted the line entirely. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, okay. I could put it back in. Yeah, I'd put it back in and zero it. Okay. Because otherwise yeah. people are, anyway. I, I, either or, I just don't want to get too far afield, but. Ralph, do you want to weigh in at all? Help us if with you, our decision-making? If, if you want me to, sure. I, I, I think your perspectives are, are always very valuable, recognizing okay. it, you know. Well, let me let me just talk about. Of course, we will talk about the IT, but I, I do think there are a couple of things you ought to be thinking about. One is, um, I am not a fan anymore of assessments. Without that's, we're talking about the facilities assessment um, by a professional, without some other more firm idea of where you would actually put a police, specifically a police department, where there is now no serious alternative. I also believe that to a large degree, you can assess that with the people who are there, particularly Chief Quigley, he can tell you what he lacks. And probably you can come up with what really needs to be done without necessarily committing yourself to a new facility, but making that one somehow or other and taking out his Quonset hut and some of the other stuff in back there, which don't really belong there at all, 
um, and extending that building. So I think the idea that we should have an assessment from a professional who will come up with a new building is not a good idea. And I've had, I've just seen so many assessments, whether it's schools or whether it's town hall or any other thing or fields or playgrounds, you name it, we're going to get huge numbers coming back, none of which we execute on as it turns out. It really is quite remarkable, the, the inability of us to make solid decisions unless we get a, a professional and then we find out we can't do what the professional wants us to do. So I have very strong feelings about any more professional assessments as I think they lead us absolutely nowhere. We're in fact much more rigorous understanding of what the needs are by our own people and solid ideas about what you would do about it need to come first. So you, you heard me strongly about it. I'm, I'm just tired of it all because I've heard so much of it and I know how much of it has failed. Um, so you, you're pretty clear, from, you're hear, hearing me were on that one. With regard to the facilities department service vehicle, I believe they have three um, and they want a fourth. Am I wrong about that? I'm not sure. That sounds right, Ralph. Yeah, I think they've, sure. uh, Ralph, I think they've I think they've got two trucks, two utility trucks, and then a third vehicle, which I think is a repurposed police cruiser. Okay. Yeah, an SUV, right? Yeah. I think that's right. Um, the idea was to have a vehicle for each of the four people there. Is that what that's my understanding of what it was supposed to be? Um, or at least getting closer to that, yeah. Getting closer to it. And I think what we had originally hoped was that you could, we could get an um, electric vehicle, which obviously does not seem to be possible right now. Ford is backed up at 225,000 mm -hmm. of these things that they can't yep. ship. So I think they were a long way from getting that. Um, yep. So my, my own view of this one is that's one you might actually say, well, we've got three other uh, general purpose, small Prius, oh, not Prius, the, um, anyway, the, uh, they're not Prius vehicles. They're the, the EVs, uh, yeah. What are they? The electric vehicles. The electrical, yeah, the electric you vehicles. Yeah, I, you know, you can probably live with it. I understand you won't have a full suite of tools with you, but those vehicles are generally available and you could actually wait until you can get a an electric vehicle when they become more available. So again, I know it's postponing it one more time, but I'd postpone that one based on what I, I do think is probably practical at this stage to do. Um, uh, other than that, you know, the, the only other very big one in my mind is picking this Taiwanese vendor for a program which will probably take years to fully execute. Well, every year we're going to see a, a whole classroom and others, we got 12 classrooms, we're gonna end up full, you know, filling with these things. You, you have at least five years, six years of this. I, I actually think picking a, a vendor who oh, does everything in Taiwan, doesn't even assemble in the United States, is high a high risk proposition. Um, I don't disagree they ought to have something in the order of a touch screen panel, I don't but there are an awful lot of touchscreen manufacturers out there, either it's um, Japanese or South Korean. Um, and, and you have to ask yourself, why would you trap yourself? It's kind of like the, the New Holland vehicles we had, the, um, I guess these are the backhoes that eventually are, are Samsung in one case, but anyway, they seem to go out of service or they're, they're not repairable. Here we got ones that in fact may not even be available or repairable within two years. Um, I'm saying, can't we actually revisit this one and take a look and see whether there aren't some other vendors out there um, who might actually have, and there are many others, quite frankly. I doubt very much that ViewSonic even makes the panels. I suspect they're probably Samsung or, or yeah. Sharp anyway. Um, it, we really ought to ask the question, why are we doing this right now in view of the serious risk that these things will not be available or, re or repairable in two years? And who knows? I can't say they will or they won't, but this is the highest risk thing I know of right today. So anyway, those are my major thoughts about where we are on this stuff. And of course, you know what I thought about you know, Ron's uh, request and, and how that might be an opportunity if in fact he is willing to give some more thought to it. So. Right. And you're, you're 
um, focus was on why are we going to on-premise servers versus cloud? And we yeah, want to give him the chance. Yeah, that's to right. Make that it's, case. it's really, it's really, it comes from, stems from one simple thought, um, and that is that what what happens if we get a denial of service um, um, attack? And and right now we we do not have a defense other than to prevent it in the first place, as I see it. Now I, I could be completely wrong, but because we have tied both our both sets of servers and storage together, they are literally linked together. They are one is not separate from the other in any meaningful way. So if you get a denial of service, and I could be totally wrong on this, and I'd be glad to be proven wrong, but if you get a denial of service, you're down and you have no access whatsoever. If you had a cloud service, even if it was just data and a few executable files, you would certainly be able to get up partially up almost immediately without necessarily having to pay off whoever it is who's doing the ransomware. But, but I could be wrong on this and I'm glad to be proven wrong. But my instinct on this is if he had a completely separate and offline server and, and storage configuration, he would have true redundancy. Right now, in the case of a denial of service, I don't believe it's true redundancy. This redundancy in case of a failure of a server, it's redundancy if it's a failure of storage, but it's not redundancy in the sense of getting a denial of service attack. And that's my view of that one. Um, I, now, let, let's, let's get our definitions. Um, aligned. Um, denial of service attack is when <clears throat> a bad actor harnesses thousands of um, PCs and hits your website, floods it, overwhelms your website with um, requests to the point where your servers can't handle all those requests, your gateways can't handle it, and your site goes down. Ransomware is a different um, animal where a bad actor um, injects code that um, locks everything up and the bad actor has the only key. And, and well, I think we need to be clear with Ron as to what our concern is. I, I, I should be clear. I, I'm, I'm more concerned about ransomware. You, you, it's, you can, you can, it doesn't take you down necessarily permanently with denial of service, but ransomware does. So Okay. Yep. So yep. my understanding from Ron, and I'm glad he's coming tonight to be absolutely solid with this, is that ransomware what is, is a, the primary focus of their security uh, configurations and architecture. Um, and that's why we've upgraded all of our equipment was to protect us from those kinds of um, attacks, uh, ransomware attacks, more, more than anything, um, you know, through through the the known um, methods um, and and protections that our vendors provide us for for those known methods of attacking us with with ransomware. So we'll, we'll see what he has to say. But I just want to be clear on that because I was thinking something totally different um, uh, when when you you suggested DNS uh, denial of service. But anyway, in, in a way, I probably that's a generalization. Is both both are denial of service. But anyway, the point is that ransomware is a, an incredibly serious question, um, and we yes. don't have any way. We have no data except locally, and that's mm -hmm. that's a huge issue for me. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Did uh, we get Michelle back or should we page her? Um, if we've got questions. I could certainly see if she can rejoin us for a minute about the facility, but. You've got me, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Michelle. Oh, Phil. good, 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 okay. She, so, has a, she has an event for her daughter tonight, so. Okay. Yeah. So Chris, have you heard the discussion with regards to the, um, Emergency response facility study. Um, I, I did. Um, I think we had talked about um, uh, Michelle and I talked earlier about maybe uh, holding that anyway. At this point, um, th there are 
there are some things, and I, I, I heard Ralph's commentary and, and, and he's spot on in terms of skills. There are some things though that our staff can't do, like you know, jail cell design and and you know, and, th and those kinds of things. And and there are codes and stuff that that we'd have to have someone explain how we would have to meet them going forward. Um, the one thing I can tell you is that there was a Michelle had someone on site the other day and she did a walkthrough of the current facility. And they said there's really nothing you can do with it. It's it's just not it's not expandable. It's really not repairable anymore, in, in, except in patches. It just the site just doesn't work for any kind of expansion. And um, the long term answer would be to do something else somewhere. That said, the the question is where. And if we don't have a where, it's very hard to study, <laughs> right? It, to see if that would be a suitable location. So I, I think there's a fair question to say maybe maybe we need to delay this a little bit further. It's, it's not that it's not important. I think the point is we need to get everything lined up the right way to do it the most efficiently, and it may not be right now. Does that kind of give you some input? Yes. Yes, Chris, on, on the on the jail cell, I know that was one of the top items when I was there for the uh, the walkthrough, right. and, and I know that we're not in compliance with that. What, what's the calendar or the timeline on getting that into compliance? Um. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I know we, we have a possible answer, a temporary one on the interview room. I think we have something we might be able to pull together on that. Um, I know that they're working to see what they can do on the jail cells. Um, and we don't keep people in there all the time, but the fact is whenever you have somebody, you have to meet the codes. Um, right. So, and, and, and we're trying to find a workaround that works, right? Um, um, and then it works economically, right? I mean, you don't want to spend a crazy amount of money on to get them to code if, if there's other fundamental problems with the building that aren't kind of working long term, but I, I don't, I don't have that answer immediately, Susan. Is there um, a working group that is um, looking into possible solutions, creative solutions? On an interim basis, yeah, yeah, we're, we're talking internally on a regular basis with Chief Quigley and um, um, and Michelle and um, and, and Nick uh, about what we can do to try to you know bridge a gap. Right. Is there anything that we can do with another town in an, in an intermunicipal agreement to hold, um, I'm not sure what the right word is. Um, oh, no, no, I know. Yeah, you were talking about, about uh, like a prisoner, like they can share prisoners and, and hold them for if, if we need to. Yes, there's things yes. we can possibly do like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, they just have to have space, right? I mean, uh, right. you know, it, it's, yeah. it's Nobody has any large amount of cells. I mean, so I, I guess the model I'm thinking of is mutual aid. Yeah, no, we do. So we that, have mutual yeah. aid agreements with all our neighbors. And um, yeah. so again, I, 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 we have to address this, right? We have to not, we don't, we, we, we can't fall out of compliance because we need to have that facility on top of the jail cell capability. Um, and it's, and, and it's a priority item. Um, that said, I, I, I uh, that was not one of the topics that Michelle and I talked about earlier today. So, um, but it is on the radar, Mike and team. Mm -hmm. Chris, just um, just for clarification, when did the jail cells go out of compliance um, as a result of this new code? I think we've been limping along, Brian, for a number for several years to try to keep them in compliance. Yeah, um, and uh, and I, I think the state's been, you know. Again, we're not the only community that has old facilities, right? Well, so, that's the heart of my question. Right. Um, so so they want to know that you're not ignoring them, right? They want to know that you're not, you know, look, looking in the eye and saying, hey, we're not going to do anything. So um, I think we've shown good faith in our, in our efforts to try something. So again, I can circle back for sure and get a more concrete answer. That's how I, I, I'm, I know we're actively working with them. So it's not like- Okay. We're and, and, and people are also thinking about ways that we can at least bring them closer to compliance and and and- Keep the, you know, keep the regulators at bay until we can come up with a permanent solution. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not talking about sitting on this for any length of time. I mean, we could come back yeah. as this fall with something if we have more of an answer. And and um, you know, we um, you know, it, it, there's been <laughs> there's been a lot of conversations going on lately, as I, I think you will see. So it's. Uh, uh, okay. We have to, it sounds like we need a full conversation around this, and it goes beyond tonight. Um, yeah. but, but in terms of the compliance, is it, is, is it's principally the, 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 the doors, well, the, 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 the bars and the, and the door, 
uh, which are, are also bars, need replaced with a solid wall. Is that pretty much the summary? I, I, yeah. Again, I I, I don't I'm, I I can't. Okay. I, I, I there are sa- there are modern ways of doing this that are different. You know the you know the old yeah. Western jail cell is not what you know I'm talking about. You know you slam the door and you lock the key, right? Yeah. Um, people can hurt themselves with those now <laughs> if they want to be creative or stupid. Right. And, um, and it's also a visibility and access thing. So um, I think they're done differently now. Um, that said, um, again, I, I can get you, I, I, again, I, I think some of that deep does with circular, but I, I can get that for you. It's not a, not a problem. Okay. It's really more curiosity. I mean, it's, it's, it's a question of buying time. It's not a question of avoiding the issue. So Chris, on this line item, can you see our share screen, Chris? Um, line 31 here on the new facility assessment. Um, are you saying then that this could be zero? Yes, I, I, I think that I think we could zero it out and not hurt ourselves in the very in, in the short term. Because I want I don't know that we're going to be able to do much in the very short term anyway. So we, you know, the fall is not that far away, um, and and if if we have time to circle around a better solution. And again, I, I, I and I, I, you know, I take Ralph's comments um, seriously too, making sure that we maximize the value of our own knowledge. So, so are you comfortable directing us to remove the seventy-five? I, I'm comfortable that if you do, I'm okay with it. So, <laughs> because okay. we, so, so I'm not directing you to remove it, but I'm telling you that we're okay with removing it at this point. All so, right. um, and and Chris, would that come as a surprise to the chiefs, or are the chiefs kind of moving along with this? This this train of thought sort of as as it evolves. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, this accelerated as you know the spring more quickly than we thought uh, over the, yeah. the winter, uh, and I guess you know we had that little weird run of really crazy cases, right? That 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 amplified the challenges. Yeah. You know, we have a DWI or something over a weekend. A lot of people just get bailed out, and you know, so we had a weird run, and it it kind of shone a spotlight in a way that you know doesn't normally happen. It's like if you have you know, with the, with the old salt dome. I mean, you had a couple of heavy storms and you suddenly realized the salt dome, which works when we don't have many storms, didn't work for big stuff, right? So, um, I, I, yeah, they, they'll be okay. Um, it, it, with, it, with the understanding, that this is still at the at the front, at the top of the agenda for for ongoing conversations and, and, and everyone's committed to that. So um, I think that's okay. I, I, we, we, if we don't have a full baked answer now, why step forward? Let's get at something that's better baked so we can all be moving along together better. Okay. And, and just to get your, your, sorry, I, I don't, I don't mean to shift topics. Does anyone have further questions on the facility assessment? The only question I have for the rest of the committee is, are, are you comfortable with zeroing it out now so that we have more 75,000 more to work with? I am. Yes. Yeah. Based on what Chris is saying. Brian? I, I, I am as well. I, I don't want to allocate funds that we don't know how we're even going to deploy at this point or on what site. And um, and I also agree with Ralph. I think we, you know, when, when you look at Elm Street as an example, um, the best solutions often come from our own hard work and not from hiring a third party. Um, there will be pieces of every project where we need professionals, but in terms of coming in and tell us what, what our needs are, I mean, we should know what our needs are with the exception of the code requirements. And we should be able to figure out a good site. You know, we can hire a local civil engineering firm to figure out all the site work. You don't need an architect for that. They're just going to sub it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And frankly, you know, in terms of putting pen to paper or pencil to paper on drawing a building, there's no need to ever draw a new fire fire police station there. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing new that's going to take place in this building. We should, you know, ask them to pick one they like and, 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 and drop it on, you know, get the plans and drop it on the site. Um, it's not what the architects want to hear because they want to charge a million dollar fee to draw a new building, but. Okay. So taking out that um, 75,000, um puts the town manager requests um over by now it's down to 171 yeah and at this point our trial recommendations is in the surplus of uh, 123 yeah 
so just mathematically, I'm working off of, you know, off of column D with, with process of elimination. You're at 171 now. If you, you know, if you pull, I'm not suggesting you blank this out, but just, just the math is you pull out 60 for the tiles and 60 for the vehicle, you're at 50, you're, you know, it's another 120 out, you're 50 over, which now we're close. Um, um, hold on. You, you'll you'll get there doing the math in reverse on your on your column as well, but it should get you to the same place. Well, in my, on my list, um, I have the smart panels at seventy five and the iPads at zero, and that's pending Ron's um, advice. So if if right. Um, But we also have the facilities vehicle still in the right, not in the left. Yeah. So let's put this in. And that brings us to a surplus of 62, 63. So now the only items, line items that are, we have both yeses or questions are the two school items and the it and the it in the yes. 420 yeah yeah i guess what i'm saying michael is you changed your column b balances to the two school items to the same numbers that are in the d columns which is yeah. possibly where we may end up you're going to find yourself fifty thousand dollars underfunded mm-hmm So as long as we have Chris and before Ron joins us, um, Chris, let me ask you a question. Um, and I, you know, we're going to need to take this to Nick ultimately. But um, if we hold back on the facilities vehicle, is it fair to assume that we can give him, give him another uh, retired police cruiser, at least on an interim basis, so that we've got, you know, so that he actually has a, a four vehicle fleet. He's got you know two, two utility um, pickups fully equipped, and then he's got two SUVs that you know that can be used for you know for for other purposes. Um, I guess potentially. Remember, we have the green community stuff we're supposed to be careful about. We're not supposed to be repurposing um, things like like that. Um, we have to be careful about them. Um, it just depends on what kind of shape they're in, right? Um, you know, so, um, uh, you know, one of the things that it won't be able to do is plow, right? So one of the reasons that the, 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 the fleet does multi things, you know, it, it, it plows parking. So it, 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 we, have a, we have a dearth of private contractors. Uh, now we, this winter, we were very fortunate. Uh, it wasn't a big problem. Uh, if we had had major storms, we would have been significantly behind. And it's not just us. So uh, that, that, if we don't have it now, it's, 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 we're just going to next winter uh, and again, the, I don't know what the supply chain lead time on these things is. Um, so, um, but we could we could find them interesting. I don't think it's a debate the longer term. We need to get you know right. get him the right vehicles. Um, j just as there's no debate that was sooner or later we need to retail Deer Hill, and sooner or later we need to do facilities. You know, an investment in the in the facilities. The question is, what do we need to do right now? Right. Um, with regards to green communities, I mean that I understand the sensitivity there. We promised that we wouldn't recycle, you know, uh, pure fossil fuel powered vehicles. You know, the flip side is he, he wants an, an EV, an electric truck. And it just isn't available. I know, yeah, yeah. and it's not available. So, you know, does, does green communities want him to go out and buy a new gas powered one? No, no. I, I again, Brian, we, that's one of the things we can make work, right? I yeah. Mean, uh, it's one of the, I mean, you know, it, you, you make do what you got to do, right? I mean, right. Uh, the, um, you know, we, if you remember eight or nine years ago, we repurposed that that pickup and we put a new bed in it. We got another five years out of it, right? So, right. so you know, if we get if we get one of the police Tahoes and, and you know, make sure it works, it's better than having no vehicle at all. Um, yeah. I mean, they're, you know, they're four wheel drive and whatnot. Um, I mean that that might be the thought that thought to buy time, and I think that gets us awfully close to you know to balance. We're still fifty thousand light. 
And uh, folks will let me know if, if and when Ron joins us. Um, and I, I miss him for any reason. Um, okay. Are there any other thoughts? He's here. He's here, Brian. I'm sorry. I didn't even notice him. So. Okay. Um, you want to promote him? Yeah, please, please promote him. And I just had one more comment I want to share with you before we switch over to Ron. Mm -hmm. I'm listening. Ron, they got me. Okay. So um, one thing I just want to put on radar for you is, is we, as we work through um, both the budget and the free cash, whatever that is, you know, come, come the fall. Um, I just want to make sure everyone, you know, is, is, in, in tune with the fact that we did multiple appropriations last, um, well, in the last, both the annual town meeting and the fall town meeting, um, where we, you know, appropriated amounts on the presumption that we're going to get grants and that that money will come back to capital budget. So, you know, if, if you were just to net out all of our prior appropriations, you would come to a capital budget stabilization fund balance of less than a million dollars prior to this cycle. Um, but, you know, the, the, the very clear discussion with each of those departments on each of those appropriations was the grant would come back to capital budget and that's how it brings it back to the million dollar balance. So I, I just want to make sure that when those grants start coming back in that they find their way back to capital budget, otherwise we're materially below our million dollar threshold. So just just a request. I, I want the, I want that you know just to be on, on your radar so it doesn't doesn't get lost because there's a couple hundred thousand dollars of, of funding that you know we're assuming brings us back up to our, our million dollars when those grants come back. Um, and the and the inverse is you know if 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 we weren't going to get grant money back we wouldn't have appropriated them because we didn't have the money, quite candidly. Oh, that's the standard practice here, Brian. So I'm, I'm good. Yep. Okay. I'm trying. I'm having trouble promoting Ron. I don't know what the problem is. I've tried six times. Um, let me see. If, I don't think I have the ability. Panelist attendees. Yeah, I don't have any control over it. I just made you co-host, so you could you could try. I've tried it a couple of times. Um, I'll probably mess it up. But... Yeah, I don't even see them in here. Participants. There he works. is. Oh, okay, so he's yeah. He just needs to unmute and put on a video. There we go. Good evening, hey, Ron. Good evening, Ron. So, um, Ron, we're just uh, trying to beat this um, uh, capital request list. Um, you know, in, in, into submission vis-a-vis -vis the actual funds that we have available, um, and there. Are, handful of questions with regards to, to IT. Um, I think, you know, the, and, and, and I'll just highlight three of them and we can jump in and, and, and hit each one of these. But the first is I think that there's still um, some concern among several of the, you know, members of the committee with regards to um, being entirely on-prem with regards to the data centers, number one. Um, number two, I think we, you know, want to, understand if there's um, either any time flexibility or budget flexibility with regards to the iPad request. Um, and then number three, um, I think there's some concern about the country of origin with regards to the um, interactive smart panels and the, you know, the, 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 the risk of that supply could um, 
potentially not be available to us at some point in the not too distant future under certain scenarios. So I think those are the three headlines. Um, and you know, why don't we just jump in with the data center unless anyone from capital wants to add anything at the front end to, to the to, you know, to the agenda for Ron to, to, to contemplate. No, I think you've, you've captured the, our three areas of, of questions. Yes. Perfect. Let's, yeah. let's dive in. Um, and I, I guess with regards to the, you know, the data center and the on-prem on versus cloud um, subject, um, you know, there, there is some, some ongoing concern that we're not doing anything in terms of backup in the cloud. I, I think I, what I'd like to suggest is perhaps Ralph could articulate this more succinctly than I can. So I, I suggest Ralph, you, you lead off here. Okay. Ron, you, you, first, I think you've done a good job. So I'm not here to criticize or anything else, but to kind of more or less restate where I've been in the past. And this goes back many years when I felt that our dependence on servers in our two locations, which are essentially tied together, would become a serious risk if we had a ransomware attack. And I had said a denial of service, and maybe that was too general. I really think ransomware is the, is the huge issue here. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the way we now run those two servers and storage is they are essentially working together at all times. They're exchanging um, files, um, applications, and everything else simultaneously. So essentially, they're one system at this time. And therefore, there is no offline storage of any kind that I know of that would be available to us should we, in fact, get a ransomware attack. So my issue has been for some time that we need to have both data and also maybe executable files and maybe the, uh, the authorization for those files somewhere else offline, where in fact, if in fact we lost everything, that is we lost it because of a ransomware attack and, because, and I'm assuming the ransomware attack would take our entire system down. And I understand we've got a lot of protections, but I'm concerned about it. It's just, nevertheless, that in fact, if we get that, then we don't have no way to recover other than to either have someone come in and begin to find out what the keys are to change the, the lock that they've got on our system and or um, we're, gonna pay the, we're gonna pay the ransom and hopefully get it back in some other way. So the question to you right now and, and, and very straightforwardly is, should we not at this time have a serious ability to have offline storage along with some of the executable files for the apps we have? And shouldn't we do that immediately as part of your program going forward and not wait another year to do that? And I, when I say that, I understand that that perhaps costs some more money, but I'm not so sure how much more. And so the follow on question to that is what can we reduce in the way of either storage, storage capability, CPU or CPU capability and or RAM or RAM capability under the current program of buying that would give us some room to address the, 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 the question of how to have offline storage and at the same time to reduce the cost of the current purchase more in line with what we thought we might actually see, which was going to be some escalator over what you had paid about five years ago for the same basic equipment. So those are the questions and I'll leave it uh, with you to answer as you much as you wish. Um, I don't have a lot more to say about it. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate that, uh, that information and those questions. Um, we could literally talk about this for two hours straight and it'd still be digging deeper and deeper to try to see all the finite configurations and options and, and, and settings that we have that would specifically um, mitigate ransomware. But I'll, I'll approach it on a high level overview without digging too far into the weeds. And if I do go there, by all means, tell me to be quiet and, and <laughs> go back up to the 5,000 foot level. But essentially, we are well protected from ransomware. We are well protected from denial of service attacks. What we currently have in place is 
two storage assemblies, two SANs, which would be those Dell uh, SANs that we're replacing, that replicate every four hours, two to four hours actually. In the event that we had ransomware, which by the way, is typically targeted for a particular user or data set, would not necessarily impact the entire SAN. So not all data on the SAN would be encrypted, just some data based on what that user's rights or uh, permissions had access to. So we re actually received ransomware about four or five years ago from a teacher who opened an email. All of her local documents on her local C drive were encrypted. She did not um, back up her data to a thumb drive or a flash drive, so we could not recover that. We have been explicit with our users that local machines currently are not being backed up. If you have data that you need backed up, it needs to be on a server drive, a map drive. In the event that she had been using a map drive, we would have backed up that data to a third location, which has no, no possibilities of being impacted from ransomware. So we have a... CEA data center, we have a CMHS data center, and those two systems replicate approximately four hours apart at the SAN level. In the event that we ended up with ransomware, we would break that replication. So our first go-to would be the second <clears throat> data center to recover from, because whatever's replicating in the first would not have the ability to replicate to the second. Ransomware does not have the capability to replicate or to encrypt files at that communication level. It's SAN to SAN. It's not server to server. So it's a completely different layer of replication that's occurring. That's the first thing. The second thing is I mentioned a third backup, which resides physically at the police station, which, by the way, also replicates data like for like to a Barracuda cloud backup in the cloud. So not only do we have a third backup solution we can pull and recover from at police, but we can also pull from the cloud. As I say that, we are actually changing that. We are actually going to a different data, uh, a different backup uh, and recovery solution only because when it comes to recovering an entire data center or an entire server, it's easier for us to uh, from a, a continuous of operations perspective, it's easier for us to recover from this new solution called Veeam than it is from our, uh, our site recovery manager, which is tied to our VMware, our virtualization platform. So currently we have licensing that does replication. We have licensing that takes a snapshot of a data center and puts a, a image of that in the other data center. So in the event that we end up with a catastrophic failure, we can fire up that other data center and be live in a matter of hours. That is a complex problem, a, a complex uh, solution and something that takes uh, a certain amount of level of expertise and um, even uh, third party mm -hmm. vendor participation to do effectively. It is not something that I feel comfortable with, with the amount of times that we test it or have the ability to fail over and fail back using that solution. And so that is a, a primary reason why we're changing not only our backup solutions, but also our replication and our disaster recovery to this new Veeam solution. So there's a lot said there, but I, ultimately what I want to convey is, is that from a ransomware perspective, we are well healed with many, many points of, of recovery from different appliances and different data locations or storage locations that we currently have available. And those are being improved by this last data center or this upcoming data center refresh. So rest assured, we are as in good a shape as anybody when it comes to recovering from um, uh, uh, a cyber security attack that is involved with ransomware. Um, Can I ask you the more simple question though, is do we have a full data set of everything, all the critical data, offline somewhere not in this town but somewhere else does all is all data somewhere available to us somewhere else <laughs> other than locally and or one of our local potential servers 
Or our back, our Barracuda appliance, which backs up both data centers, is replicating to a Barracuda cloud. It is not an efficient option for us because it only replicates what's on the Barracuda. What we're looking to do is we're looking to take um, additional um, storage in the cloud, which gives us more capacity to back up as well as replicate what's currently on our existing SANs. So it so yes, we do have a cloud-based solution that backs up, but it's limited. We're going to a better solution, which will give us more capacity in the future. And the better solution is in the 420K uh, request. Correct. Yeah. And one other um, point I, I that was I raised. I'm, not, I'm still not clear. Is, at some point, when do we get to 100% is the question. I mean, I'm trying to get to, <clears> is everything, what, what are we not going to get out of this replacement for Barracuda, I guess is the question. Everything, everything is backed up by the Barracuda. So we can recover servers, we can re recover files, individual files, we can recover everything. That is one of our recovery points, as well as the SANs, which also have that replication that allows us to recover from a previous point in time, usually four hours, that also gives us the ability to recover 100%. I understand. And where is the Barracuda server located? Please. Oh. So it's not really offline. No, but it replicates to offline. So there's a cloud-based Barracuda cloud that's replicating with that appliance. And is that, is, where is that cloud located? I, um, I, I don't have that exact information. In the United States somewhere. It's not in Cohasset. And, and it's 100% backed up at that point? Yes. We currently have 90% utilization of that Barracuda. And that's another reason why we actually need to um, move on from it because it's pretty much reached its capacity. Okay. What was the other question? Well, the, the other one is that when when any one of us buys a, a PC, you take a look at your the CPU you're buying, you take a look at the amount of RAM you're buying, and you try to say, what are my, what's my utilization and what do I need to do and, and whether I not, for example, I need a, a graphics card. And there's, whenever we were all, anyone individual here goes and buys any kind of a computer, you look at all of the things, you look at your current utilization, the amount of processing you're using and the amount of storage you need and the amount of RAM you need. Um, do we do that? And if so, since we only have 40% utilization roughly of the CPU, and, and I don't know what the SANS were or whether the RAM was, but, um, is it really realistic to think that we should have gone from approximately a $250,000 expenditure back five or six years ago to a $420,000 expenditure today? I don't think the cost of all of that equipment has gone up at that rate, but I could be wrong. But it looks as though the number is very high to me. That's all. I, I would have to say that I'm not intimate with what we spent back in the day, but $250,000 for our current configuration seems awfully short to me. I would have said it would have been closer to 350 or even $450,000 for us to put those two data centers up even back in the day. But I will say this, you know, we've done everything that we can do to try to keep this pricing down, including, as we talked about in the last meeting, going from a, our 750, our 750 Dell server to an R650 because we didn't need the storage on those host machines because our SANs, our storage units are running everything. So we've decreased by what, eight, nine, ten thousand $10,000, whatever it was just for servers alone. So we've overturned every stone possible to try to recover funds that we don't need, uh, funds that could be allocated elsewhere because we don't need the level of storage specifically on our local servers. Again, we're talking local servers and not our storage array, our SANs, two right. totally different animals. Yep. Um, but that's one thing that we've done to try to decrease the amount of expenditure on this project. There have been other things as well. You had asked me to see whether or not we could reduce the amount of storage. And I know this is a complicated issue to get your head around, but essentially what it is, is we're purchasing approximately a 30 terabyte SAN because of the new 
technologies and deduplication and compression, we have the capacity to go up to a 60 or 70 terabytes on that same physical 30 terabytes of storage space. Depending on the type of files, if they're regular Word documents, Excel documents, then we get a ratio of potentially four to one. But if it goes to TIFF files or video, that can go down to a two to one or even a one to one. And that is where we need to be cautious. So yes, I did reduce the amount of the ask because I did reduce the amount of storage. But ultimately, if, if we went um, headstrong into back file scanning for the EDM, um, then we could potentially be looking to populate that new storage array with more drives and more storage down the road. But taking your, your um, point of interest, we, we've decreased that total amount out of the gate with the anticipation that if we need it, we will populate the sand with additional drives down the road. Uh, Ron, there was also a question um, that I, I tried to answer um, on your behalf, but I, I wasn't totally um, solid on my answer. But um, the question was, um, what, why would you not go to uh, an Azure or um, other um, cloud service? Um, why do you feel that those services don't work with our configuration? Well, that was, again, something that we've looked at for months and months and months and months and had analyzed what we had and what we needed. And in the final analysis, what it came down to was there was really no good reason to migrate to the cloud. There was no cost advantage to going there. What we were doing was we were shifting from capital to operational. That was the first big hurdle because operational can absorb that amount of increase based on compute and storage, additional firewall that have to be up there and a number of licenses as well. So it was a wash from a, from a cost perspective. What was problematic for me was the unknowns tied to the service level agreements or the support that Microsoft would give us and or third party services. When you factored that in, you didn't have a good handle on control and cost. And in this environment where we're looking mm. to set a budget in July or May and run with that budget for a year without really another bite at the apple, that could be kind of dangerous. So that was an unknown and that was a, a substantial issue for me to get around. But really the, the biggest issue was when you talk to other municipalities and school systems and organizations that leverage Microsoft and have gone that route, it's not what it's cracked up to be. It's, it's unless you have a dynamic environment where you need to spin up a lot of new processes and change things because you have a new product to launch or something like that, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us because we don't have that level of dynamics in our environment. Most of the processes, most of the applications that we run are all static in nature. It's usually, we know usually a, a six months or a year in advance that we need something and we start looking for it and then either bringing it to you or, or paying for it through an operational budget. So there were a lot of factors that we had to consider, but Ultimately, there was no real selling point to go to the cloud at this point for us. It also increased the, the complexity of the network and the management of it. I'd have to get additional training for staff. We'd have to uh, extend our network through VPN tunnels to the cloud for replication. Um, we'd be entering into another uh, virtual firewall, so it's more maintenance at that, uh, at that point, more security concerns, more vulnerabilities. It just doesn't make any sense for us to be there right now. And at the end of the day, the major concern for having um, backup in the cloud is actually happening uh, through the Barracuda um, that's, architecture. That's, the backup to the cloud is very different than running a live environment in Azure yeah. and having all of our 25 or 30 servers running up there as opposed to internal of our file, uh, internal of our data centers. That's the big difference. Yes, we are leveraging the cloud for storage. We use uh, Microsoft OneDrive, so we use SharePoint, we use Google Drive. So we're leveraging the cloud for storage to offset what we what we right. have in the data centers. In fact, that's allowed us to decrease the amount of storage that we're asking for. But at the end of the day, storage is still happening in the cloud from a backup recovery standpoint, but there's no live processes that are running there 
like we have in our data centers. So there's a so distinct it's live that processes that we're keeping on premise. Correct. Right. And so the technology risk of losing that live processing has been is mitigated by the four hour backup to the Barracuda mm -hmm. solution. So our recovery gives us options to go to the other data center and it gives us a, another recovery point, which goes to the Barracuda. So right. we have multiple recovery points in the event that something happens. You should right. you should sleep well tonight knowing that at least from a ransomware perspective, we're in a good place. Right. And we'll we have a, a multifaceted um, architecture that relies both on the cloud and on on-premises servers where we're being most efficient by putting on-premises servers where we need them for live, I'll call it live computing or live um, services and um, cloud-based backup systems for protection of the overall um, information technology environment. Is that correct? Do I have that right? That would be accurate. Right. So I, I've just got two questions. Um, and I, I think, you know, the first is just to confirm. So we're moving off the Barracuda, okay? Um, but you are gonna replace that with some new form of, of cloud backup, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so where we're gonna land after all this is two data centers, each has uh, compute servers in it, each has a SAN in it. The SANs back each other up one-to-one. -one. And if, and that would be the first stop if one of those SANs went down or one of those data centers went down, the first stop would be across town. And if we lose both of our SANs, we have a 100% backup in the cloud somewhere else. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. Okay, so the only thing we don't have in the cloud is processing. Correct. All right. All right, that was my first question. I'm glad to hear I understand it correctly. Um, the, the second is with regards to, you know, the ability to add additional drives to our SANs in the future, are these just commodity SSDs? Um, or, or is, and, and, and will we have the benefit to add them at commodity SSD pricing in the future? Or are these proprietary in some way where, you know, the, 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 the price could could get locked in as flat or even go up as, as the you know as, as the actual market price of storage is obviously always going down. Yeah. And by keep... SSD, you're talking about um, solid state drives. That's correct. correct? Just okay. a, it's just a form of disk drive that slots into these into these SANs. Mm -hmm. So we, so we did broach that subject with Dell and with the integrator and. Um, I asked them as part of the decrease in the amount of storage, what a drive would go for these days uh, for X amount of terabyte. Um, and they came back at approximately $2,000 if I remember correctly per drive. Um, whether or not those are proprietary to Dell, I couldn't say, um, I could look into that. Um, but Be right now we are talking about populating a SAN who has 10 slots populated and 15 more that can be populated for a total of 380 terabytes right potentially uh, that you know we we are looking at two thousand dollar ssd drives to populate additional slots if we need them okay so just, just some quick math if we've got 10 slots and we've got 30 terabytes so it's it's three terabytes per per drive is that right correct Okay, and it's two thousand bucks. So you're looking at basically six fifty ish, six six seventy ish. Um, actually, I guess it's six 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 um, per terabyte. Six hundred sixty six dollars per per terabyte. Is 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 that roughly what a terabyte of of commodity storage costs? I don't even know. I, I haven't priced one. I I would say that probably we would have to uh, dig into that deeper for me to give you that or verify that number. Okay. Yeah, I just I just want to be aware of of whether we're locked in, you know, with with their proprietary pricing, or we're gonna, you know, get the benefit of of 
increasing discs at lower cost, you know, every year. Um, well, well, to be honest with you, my, my goals, even though we are, we are pulling the trigger and doing this, my goals over the next few years are to migrate even more off of our internal SANS um, to OneDrive and SharePoint and Google. Right now we have students and teachers that are leveraging map drives on our internal servers that aren't being really utilized. So there's no need for that. So by forcing them to Google Drive only, um, we don't have to add to capacity to cover that. So that's one thing. The other thing was, and the other big one is, is really, um, I've tasked the systems an analyst to actually start implementing and going through with the vendor to implement SharePoint uh, integration for the document management system. So, you know, we've been we've been really talking about internal storage in case we do backfile scanning and, and load up a, a whole lot of TIFF files and and large capacity files to our internal SANS requiring more storage. But ultimately, if we can get this SharePoint to integrate correctly, then what will end up happening was you as residents will come into our portal, do a search for a document, and it won't necessarily find that document on our internal CERN, our servers or SANS. It will look to a distributed storage system in the cloud in SharePoint. So if we can configure that, we can now leverage terabytes and terabytes of storage in SharePoint that we currently don't have tied to the EDM. So that's a big, big win and something we're working on, but it's something that's going to take time and it's not something that can be rushed. Okay. So I just what, I, and I was, I was following that. So basically we can move a lot of our current activities off of our SAN entirely, which will free up our need to, to buy storage in the future. Um, Ron, if I could just ask you to, you know, again, follow up on this question of SSDs and whether or not we're really on the commodity price curve, that would be helpful. I mean, just, just, I mean, I just Googled, you know, one terabyte SSD and, you know, it's, it's a hundred bucks at Walmart. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't like, I'm just a little perplexed why they're charging us, you know, 666 bucks for a terabyte. Um, maybe, I, I don't know. Maybe I maybe. would say that it, it, I would say that Walmart's not going to come to your house and replace the drive, and they're not going to give you troubleshooting support online. Yeah. So I would say some of the costs is associated with the SLA tied to that hard drive um, and the support that's that's associated with it. You're not just buying a piece of hardware; you're buying Dell support along with it, and 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 probably a four hour or a single day replacement as well for the same cost. Yeah. I, yeah, I just it would be good to understand exactly what they're providing at that price. I think it'd be good for you to understand it too. I mean, I'm I'm certainly curious, but I mean, if if they're really just you know swapping out a you know a, a, a Seagate terabyte drive, um, if it were to fail, I mean, I, I I'm I'm completely speaking out of school technologically, but um, they're well, I can tell you this that yeah. in past jobs that I've had, we ran NetApp SANS and yeah. I looked exactly at that. And what you find is if you go outside of the manufacturer who's supporting the SAN and you put a uh, non proprietary drive, which may work fine, but if that drive throws any types of codes or has any kind of issues, yeah. that manufacturer will not touch that, that SAN. From an SLA perspective, so you could be voiding a warranty by going outside of the manufacturer of the SAN. I, I get it. Um, I, 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 I totally get it. So uh, it's an interesting question for you to have with your vendor. I mean, if we're locked into proprietary and they're getting a 600% markup on the incremental disk drive, so be it. But I think we should just, you know, you should be aware of that going in. Okay. Because I, I mean, the software is in the system, and, and maybe that's just how they make money in the end. Is is you know, it's the upcharge on the incremental disk drives because they're certainly you know certainly just throwing them in the system. I'm sure it automatically reconfigures. I got to be honest with you. Every time I go through one of these major projects that are you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost, and you start quoting um, a project of this type of scope and size, yeah, um, it's disheartening that they're not coming to you out of the gate with the best pricing. You literally go around two, three, four, five rounds and you finally come up and say, I need you to take $100,000 off this because I can't do it. And I'm, I'm gonna like, have to okay. find another solution. 
And ultimately that was my last conversation with them. And it yeah. got them, it got it, it got it down and it, and it maintained some amount of storage that we needed. Um, but, it, but it, again, it takes months for this, yeah. for this to occur. And it's, again, it eats up oh, my time and it's disheartening. Yeah. Well, I mean, these guys all get paid on commission at the end. Of the I, day. I, I get it, but I don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I, my nor, time's valuable. If it makes you feel any better, we don't get paid at all. So. <laughs> We still have a question on the iPads. Uh, Can, before we before we move yeah. on from there, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I have just a couple like very oversimplistic questions, Ron. One was, um, can this project be phased in at all to help alleviate the sticker shock that it is? For me, anyway. Yeah, not really, only because uh, you need the same hardware and software in both data centers because there's a replication and a backup and a disaster recovery component to this. So unless you did both of them at the same time, you'd lose the capacity to do that. Okay. Um, and then my only other question is, and what happens if we don't do it this year? How, how long can it be delayed? Yep. Then we lose service level agreements and we're on our, sitting on our hands in the event something happens and we're scrambling to get systems back up that are no longer supported. And that happens this next fiscal year, Ron? Yes. Thank you. So, so Ron, just, just one uh, question. So if, if I heard everything correctly, all the computing that's going on uh, locally um, is on the PowerEdge servers, correct? And I think I had asked you um, in the first or second time that we spoke about how many of our applications are cloud-based and would likely move to the cloud and when, when that might happen. So in this model that I'm looking at, should I be looking at those two servers and saying, that's really the only item you may have invested in more than you needed because the, the storage piece is still going to be needed regardless. Um, so that's kind of a tough question to answer or maybe I'm not understanding your question correctly, but I'll say this, the processes, the applications that we run internally on our servers are not that are not written so that you can just put them in the cloud. They are written to run on servers like we have. So when we when we say cloud cloud computing or, or application servers in the cloud these days, we think of what they call SaaS solutions. So it's software that's written to run at a at a, uh, in a in a unique way, different from our server client version that we run internally. Now. Think of that for a minute like um, Munis. Munis has this solution that they run for us in the cloud, or they would if we ended up going to them. Our SoftRite financial management server, on the other hand, is something that has to reside on a server that we have access to. So it's not a web-based hosted solution. It's literally part of the integral configuration of the server operating system. So there's a bit of a difference there. Now, having said that, when we talked about cloud, migrating to the cloud way back when, when we first started looking at this, we were really talking about spinning up like servers that we have in our data centers in Microsoft Azure in the cloud. So our applications wouldn't just migrate there, our, our servers and the applications would migrate there. So we wouldn't be getting away from any server, server reductions by going to the cloud. We would just be moving them. So there's a bit of a difference between an, a software application that we run in the municipality and our ability to move that to the cloud without moving the server processing that goes with it. I don't yeah, know if I'm I, describing I think, I think that well. That's exactly the question I was asking. So when you say move that server to the cloud, you're not talking about actually moving this physical server. Right. No, we're talking about moving a virtual server that's running on the four servers we're, we're, we're purchasing. So those right. R750s that we run right now, the four of them, two in each data center, those mm -hmm. run all of our applications, but they run those applications in a virtual environment. So I can add or remove them really quickly, just like yeah. I could do in the cloud. 
But the, the reason I'm asking is I, I we talk from time to time about the software that we use, and I'm not sure how wedded for the long term we are and how much we're designing how we operate around software we might not even really want to keep. So that's why I brought the question up. But and that's a good point, and it's a, and it's a challenging it's a challenging question because there isn't a lot to choose from in municipal software. I mean, there's more and more companies that are engaging in that space right now and providing us solutions. But you look at financial management, there might be three at best for us to select. And we have one of them. And that one is at end of life. They're not building anything. They're not upgrading it. They're not improving it whatsoever. So in fact, we actually just did a test last week and we stood up a 2022 server in a virtual environment and we and we moved the the uh, Softwrite data over to it with the expectation that Softwrite will come in and install their application on that server so we can test it. I'm not overly concerned because I'm hearing from other municipalities that are running this antiquated software that it runs on 2022. But I wasn't 100 percent sure of that, so it was a test we needed to make. Just like other applications, we've reached out to all our application vendors and verified that the that the version of SQL that runs their database or their application will run on a 2022 Windows server because it may not. And so I had to verify that before going forward with this plan. Okay. Thank you. That's very informative. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, we had um, a question on the state of the iPads that are proposed to be replaced. Um, if we did not replace them this year, is that a showstopper? And if we do need to, um, can we spend less with older iPads, whether that's an eighth or ninth generation iPad? Um, what, you know, what generation iPad um, are we considering for the 94,000? Well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. For two years, they've had their own tech director who's been handling hardware and software purchases for the classroom um, and curriculum. And I've been somewhat unplugged from that process. So these questions you're asking me about smart boards and iPads, I can't answer because I have not been part of I have not been in the loop with regards to how they're using those or where those are actually going. Um, mm -hmm. my, my deputy might, because I, I probably tasked my deputy with getting quotes for central office or Lisa Radden, who's now gone. Um, so he might be able to speak to that, but I, I can't, I, I don't know that. Uh, it's an important um, point for us to understand um, in trying to save some money here. And then it also goes to our concern about uh, vendor risk uh, with the machines coming out of Taiwan, with the projectors uh, yeah, I, coming out of Taiwan. And I, I it, wish I could help you and, and I can yeah. look into it for you, but I don't have any of that information at this point, because as I said, none of that was conveyed to uh, the IT department um, when they started putting these things together and right. had, a, had a plan, so. Okay. so. Let's so I understand what you just I totally understand what you just said, Ron. I, I just want to see if I can triangulate this a little bit. And let's just start with the iPads. The the iPads, the chargers, and the cases were rolled out with our original digital learning project, right? Correct. Um, which some means, amount of them. Sorry? some amount of them, but then there's been multiple purchases since that initial rollout of iPads. Are you sure about that? 100% sure. And it may not have been with done with capital money, it might have been done with grants or something else, but I know for a fact there's been at least two, if not three purchases of iPads in addition to the first rollout. I think, think the first rollout was 80. Oh, and 275 comes to mind as well. I think maybe the first ones, I want to say the first ones were were 80 along with the Chromebooks. And then there were a number of them that were um, purchased after that as well. So they have increased their inventory in iPads since the initial rollout back in 2017. 
And Some I can't get you those numbers. For the and school. I can't get you those numbers. Okay. You can or cannot? I can get you those numbers that are currently active in the schools. Yes. Okay. That it would be helpful to understand how many iPads are in the schools and also to understand what vintage they are. Because if we've got three tranches of iPads, not all of them are end of life. That is correct. Okay. I think it's important to understand that. I mean, we're, we're you know, and yeah. Okay, I will work with my deputy and I'll get that documented. And um, well, we actually have it. I'll, I'll get that over to you. Okay, so, okay. And we, you know, so what we really need to know is, you know, how many, what, what, what tranches, what's truly end of life that needs replaced? And, you know, and, and, and when do the others need to be replaced so that we can actually layer this in and intercept these things when they truly hit end of life? And also, can we work with an older generation iPad to save money on, on each unit? Okay. I will see what Dan got them for quotes and okay. what, what it is that they're, they're running with. Okay. I mean, look, we, we have an obligation to get them what they need, but... If, if there are multiple generations here, you know, I, I'm not sure we need to replace them all this year. Um, and that would open up capacity for us to do other things. Um, with regard so, to- Didn't Michelle ask us a question about CPU and memory that was associated with iPads a few months ago? Didn't that question come up already? I, I don't recall. I, no. I don't either. The only thing I recall is as asking you how many, and I divided this number by that number, and I came up with something like 350, and said, "Okay, well, that kind of passes the smell test for a you know for a really good iPad case and charger." Um, but that's about as deep as I think we we went. Um, I, I do think it's important to keep in mind this is you know these are these are elementary and lower middle school kids. Um, you don't need a lot of processing to power, power or any other kind of power, um, or certainly storage on, on these devices. Okay, I'll get you that information. You know, they're not they're not doing CAD. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, and I and I think you know your your view on what is the appropriate iPad, um, you know, for, for for the for the task that they're going to be used for is is. Is, is important. I mean, let's get them good iPads, but we don't need to, you know, we don't need to, to go overkill here. Right. Right. Okay. I'll look okay. into that. And that'd, that'd be really helpful. And the, and the question on the interactive smart panels, I understand you haven't been involved in the trials or, 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 or the selection of the, the device, but, but they've, they've landed on, you know, ViewSonic, um, touch screens, you know, lar large touch screen displays that, you know, clearly have integrated software. And, 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 and the question around that, um, you know, is, is okay, well, what happens if, if a Taiwan-based vendor is no longer, you know, available to, to, to support us in the future? Um, you know, if the software is really tightly integrated with the screens, it, 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 it could, could be a problem. My guess is that it's not. Um, they have uh, multiple. I, I did watch one of my techs install one of those um, yep. in Diego as part of the pilot, and um, it does have multiple inputs. So you could you could tie to it wirelessly. You could tie to it through USB. Um, you could hook a laptop to it. So I I it probably I know it has you know, interactive software built in, but you do have the the capability of using it in some other way. Okay. I guess we'd just be really curious of your view of, of you know, what, what do we do if, if ViewSonic's not around? I mean, can we take that, you know, maybe, maybe the software development team's not in Taiwan and the software lives on and they just integrate with someone else's panels, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, if it was, um, if it was some, you know, third world, uh, no name manufacturer that, that put these out there, I'd be concerned. ViewSonic's been around for a long time. They have a good reputation. 
Um, there's a number of resellers selling their products. Um, I can look into the SLAs and, and some of the questions that you have, um, but ViewSonic, in my estimation, based on my own purchases through them, they've been a reliable company and a good company that supports their hardware and software. So yeah, it, it, it agreed. Maybe we're dancing around the subject, so I'll just be less politically correct and, and, and say it. I mean, this this, this concerns of, around Taiwan's independence in the in the foreseeable future, um, and you know, and 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 that's that's the concern. Okay. All right. So. You know, if, if if the ViewSonic Taiwan operations were were no longer, um, you know, did, does ViewSonic is ViewSonic a sufficiently globalized company with you know software and hardware development and, and panel manufacturers located outside of Taiwan that they would just continue without a hiccup? Okay, I'll see what I can find on that. Okay, right. thank you. And Ralph, it, 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 did I accurately capture this? The concern? Yeah, I think it, yeah I, I, right. I think it is the what you're saying is it's a political question going forward, and you really need to know that there's a if the app can be separated out from the panel, then you're probably okay because you can. These panels are widely available on the marketplace for a lot less money. Um, but if it's if it's integral with the panel, there's something else. I doubt it's integral. It's highly unlikely. These panels are simply commodity products these days. So it's really the question of separating apps from the panels, in which case, if you buy ViewSonic and you can't get the panel anymore, you can certainly, you'll have the app and you can get other panels. That's that's the simple story. Okay. Hope, hopefully much, much ado about nothing, but it's, you know, it's, it's important to know plan B in, in, a, in an unthinkable situation. All right, we'll look at that. Anything else? No, that's, I, I think that's it. Um, I just want to ask the committee, are you satisfied with Ron's um, presentation? And are you comfortable with this 420,000? Is there anything else we, anything else that's nagging at you that we should run by Ron? I, I just, I'll just ask one, one kind of wacky question, Ron. If, have you simply taken the model numbers that, you know, you, you, you're, you're proposing to install and just punch those into the web to see what, you know, the pricing is right off the Dell website or, 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 uh, you know, through vendors other than the ones you're working on. Um, and do this. I, on that. That. I have done that at a, as a, as a base from like the chassis, but when you stop populating it with memory or storage drives and stuff like that, the var the variables there will send it. God only knows where. So by working with, um, integrators and coming up with that, um, I typically see, um, it, I, in the past, I've typically seen the pricing to be um, apples and oranges. So, and I don't necessarily say that, say that the web-based, you know, buy now type of thing um, is beating any pricing that we get after the third or fourth revision with an integrator in Dell directly. Um, so I would say that it's great if you're looking at a chassis model and you want to build off of that. It gives you a price point to start with. But at the end of the day, when you we finally configured what you need for your environment, um, it's tough to do that off a website. Okay. All right, I don't, I don't have any further questions. Does anyone else? I'm good. I'm almost, almost it. Okay. Okay. So well, Ron, you're going to come back to us with regards to what we, you know, what's truly in need of replacement on the iPads right now, and with a view on uh, technology risk around this, this, this vendor in a, in a scenario that none of us prefers to think about. Is that? Yeah, I'll I'll shoot you guys off an email, and if you need any kind of elaboration off of that, um, you know okay. we can go further. That that okay. would be great. 
Okay. I got to jump on an advisory meeting, but good seeing all you right. all. We, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to as well. But thank, thank right. you very much, Ron. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Okay, thank I, you. I suspect Chris is going to want to jump to seven as well. Um, so, so, Brian, I, I just want to tell everybody that if you go on OneDrive under schools, there is a very detailed uh, document called Tablets Quote, and it, it has a lot of information as to the generation that they're proposing, the units that they're replacing. So, okay, and that's, that's, in the, that's in the capital budget drive, shared drive? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to email it to people if you prefer me to do that. Uh, I mean, if you if there. you've got it there, you might as well just tag it and email it out to everybody. But um, okay, we should all read that. But it sounds like we're not going to resolve it, you know, at this moment. So let's wrap up um, on on this. It, it 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 and let me just sort of make a statement. Anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but do we have consensus around you know the tile, the facilities study, and possibly the facilities vehicle being items that you know should should uh, you know should be excluded this year? Is that is that roughly speaking, you know, the first line of consensus? On the service vehicle, I have yeses across the board. After Chris's comments, though, I would say I'm not inclined to feel okay. we need to fund this. So I would okay. agree with you, Brian, that those three items you just listed, I would say anyway, we defer funding on those. Okay. I, I do want to talk to Nick and see how he feels about that. I know he was all over, you know, he was unresolved, I guess I would say, with regards to what he wants to do. Um, and we didn't talk about the possibility of getting another you know, getting another retired police car, but if we're buying two more police cars, that means we're retiring two police cars. Um, okay, so maybe let me rephrase this. It, it seems there's consensus on the, on the tile. I wanna to talk to Nick about that too, just to make sure that I'm accurate, that the ones that in dire, or in dire need have been taken care of already. And, you know, and, and then the, the, the delaying the facility study until we actually know what, what we wanna study. Um, we've got a question mark on this facilities vehicle, which hopefully we can, you know, just get another police car. That gets us to fifty thousand dollars underfunded, okay? Or we would be spending fifty thousand dollars more than call it a balanced budget, um, which to me is getting awfully close. Um, I don't follow that math. Sorry, say that again. No, I don't either. Okay. At the bottom of column D, column D it's yeah. $171,000 uh, funding gap. Yeah. That's based on um, what's in the warrant, not what um, what Michael is. is. I, I, am, I, I, I totally understand. Um, this is starting with the town's views. If I back oh, out, sorry. okay, if I back out the tile, which is 60,000, mm -hmm. okay, now I'm down to 110. Mm -hmm. I back out the facility study, which mm -hmm. I added zero. So we're still at 110,000. Mm -hmm. Back out the facilities vehicle, we're down to um, we're down to fifty thousand dollars under fund. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's assuming that you go with the projectors and the iPad. I, I'm leaving the projectors as is for now, because until we until we know we can back something out, my at least my starting point is you know. It, it, it's arbitrary to back it out. Um, but yeah, that, that gets us to $50,000, you know, underfunded. Okay. Now we need to look at the iPads closely and figure out if, if, you know, what actually needs replaced this year. I'll be surprised if the answer is zero. It might be. Um, it might be 93. I, I don't know. I mean, we're going to have to look and hear from Ron what actually needs replaced this year. Um, but hopefully we could reduce that number. Um, and with regards to interactive smart panels, I, I, you know, I, this started as a question about, you know, the vendor. I'm not really sure how it became a question of the amount. Um, but I, you know, 
do we is the idea that we would do half of one building is is that i mean I, I think that's Michael's. I yeah, I, that's Michael's. I mean, we haven't really spent a lot of time on this, but but you know, if we're going to do it, uh, do we just you know do one building at a time, which is kind of what's been discussed you know, in the past, or do we, you know, do we cut this in half, do half a building, and 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 spread this out over? Um, you know, if if we need to to, to to get to our um, zero figure. Yeah, we should consider that. But since we yeah. since we went through this uh, line item, and I agreed instead of putting zero, I'd put a seven seventy five k if if asked. Um, the situation has changed, and there, in our trial, we've got about one hundred twenty three thousand surplus. That's not enough to cover both of the smart panels and the iPads. Yeah. Um, so you, you might have to reduce, um, those two okay. line items to, to, to make it, okay. but I, I can leave this as is, or I could, um, t take, um, 122,000 and, um, add it to each of these lines and see where we come up with. I mean, again, that's, that's arbitrary. I think we need to figure out what, what we need to do on the iPads. Okay, and that's that's the starting point with the iPad number. I don't think there's any point in us, you know, engineering yeah. numbers. And then we need to make a decision as to what we want to do um, on the, you know, on the middle school. Now, if if it turns out that we don't do the facilities vehicle, okay, and if we were to do both of these in their entirety, which I'm not suggesting is the case. I'm just saying, if we did do both of these in the entirety, we would have overspent by fifty thousand dollars. And where would that come from? Uh, it would take us, you know, fifty thousand dollars below our million dollar balance on the uh, on the stabilization fund. That's where we'd, come from. we'd be at right. nine fifty instead of a million. So I think the next step is to be absolutely solid on the town manager requests for the smart panels and the iPads. That those those numbers could change is what we yeah think. we need we we definitely we need real numbers particularly around the well we need real numbers on both yeah I'm going to leave them both at zero on the trial yeah just just as a way to um, uh, flag them let me make a suggestion put to put TBC instead of zero I don't want anyone to interpret this as being like that we intend to zero this out because I think in any case. The numbers are going to be bigger than zero. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. It's it's more of a signaling issue than anything else. Okay. Let me let me jump in for a second, I, Brian. A couple of things I th I would think about. One is there any grant capability the schools have not used that might actually be applied to those two items? Okay. Um, and number two, is there anything unspent with regard to other? approved projects which came in under budget that have not been reallocated back into our um, uh, stabilization fund? So I've, I've asked that question um, and the answer I got back is, you know, which will bring back memories is that we scraped, you know, all, all the prior appropriations really hard last year and released everything that, you know, was complete um, where there were surplus balances left over um so there is there, there there really wasn't much left to go after other than projects that have been completed literally in the past 12 months and most of the things we appropriated last year are, are you know either not complete or didn't generate a positive balance so i've i've asked jennifer to look at this and I, the answer came back there's really there's really nothing there now there's something more than nothing there but and i can re-ask the question but I don't think we're going to get sort of the whatever it is, fifty, sixty thousand dollar lift that we got last year. Okay. Um, just to um, circle back on the data center, four hundred twenty spend. Can we just go around and give me um, your your thoughts? Yes, no, TBD. Um, so, um, Francine. So I'm still struggling with this one and and 
but I'm not sure that I can say anything more than yes, based on what Ron said, because if those SLAs are expiring, then he's a we, the town is SOL, if you will. Right. And so, yeah. but what really bothers me then, I think about this, I mean, these are this is a large dollar amount. IT was allocated a large dollar amount last year as well in relation to all the other asks and the total money. I think that last year, they were also the largest allocation. And last year I looked and the projection for this year was $250,000. Now he's asking for 420, a 70% increase. He had to have known this was coming this is a significant increase in what he expected. And my fear is he's gonna be asking for something, uh, you know, a large number next year and put us in a position where we have, we can't say anything but yes. And I don't like that feeling with this size dollar amount. So we should bring that to so, his- Well, uh, I spoke to in his, my piece. Yeah. The, the next time he comes to us, which is next week, we should raise that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know where it's going to get me, but I feel better that I got it off my chest. So thank you. <laughs> no, but it's a point well taken. Susan, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with Francine on the, the expiration of the, the SLA is, is a great concern. Um, so we are kind of backed into a, a little bit of a corner. Um, I, the number that's on the screen here, the 420, the last document he gave us, it was 433.7. So did he say tonight that he, he was able to negotiate them down further? Are we, are we positive that's not the actual number, I guess, is my question. I believe so. Um, I'm not sure where I got that number, but uh, it would either be Michelle, most likely it was from Michelle. Okay. But I'm not sure. It also might be the number that I spoke out loud in our last meeting and it ended up in the spreadsheet, which is a possibility. Okay. But we should double check that against Ron's last communication. Right. Yeah, he, he had a document he had uploaded on uh, March 8th and the number was 433.666. Right. Oh, well, it's 420 in the town manager request. That's where the 420 where came from. from. Who who inserts it into the town into the warrant? Michelle. Okay. Okay. I think it's a good question anyway, just to confirm like that's the number yeah. you're asking for. All right. So we still have questions. Okay. All right, um, so I'm due on an advisory in about uh, five minutes, which I will go do. And anyone that wants to join us is welcome to. I just ask that not everyone speak because it didn't trigger a public meeting issue. Um, but with the uh, six minutes that I've got, um, anything else that, that anyone else on the committee would like to discuss? I, th I think we've used our time effectively. Okay. Let me... Next week's meeting, when yeah. would that be? Now you're traveling, Mike, and, and yeah. more clarity on what days you're available. I'm certainly available next Wednesday. Monday and Tuesday are problematic. Okay. How do yeah. people feel about the 29th? That works for me. Fine. Okay. Ralph? Yep, works for me. Yep. Okay, five o'clock. Thank you. Yep. yep. Okay, five o'clock it is next Wednesday. Um, and we'll try to put all of this through after hopefully getting these last few few items resolved. Right. Um, I think we went a long way tonight in getting to our final answer. We really- We, we, we have a line of sight. Um, yeah. We just, you know, we just need to make these numbers fit now. Um, yeah. 
and then we need to confirm some of our assumptions just to make sure that you know we don't create a firestorm on, on any of them. Um, with that said, let me let me take the next. I'm going to take three of the next four minutes and, and just give people a, a quick heads up. So, select board meeting last night um, uh, introduced. I shouldn't say introduced or advanced. Uh, the likelihood that you're we're going to see on the warrant several very large items. So town hall, you're obviously aware of, and you know the quick update. You know, per, per Michael's note to all of us is that CPC only stepped up for a million bucks. So you're looking at twenty two million dollars worth of worth of uh, excluded debt on that one. Um, that's you know to put that in perspective, that's about a little over four hundred dollars. Um, incremental tax bill for the average, the median household in the town, okay? Um, there's also a discussion um, about creating, well, there's also a discussion about new taxes for specific purposes that, you know, are not being adequately served right now by the traditional capital appropriation mechanism. Um, you know, which is funded out of the levy. And frankly, we're not going to get a whole lot more funding out of the levy. So, you know, specifically roads, um, we seem to be in okay shape for this year, but going forward, if in fact the, you know, the run rate of road spend is a is million dollars, it's, there's just no way for cap that for, for capital to fund that based out of this mechanism and this process. So there's a, you know, there's a, a, an article being drafted for a, um, a special stabilization fund, which would be funded by a special tax um, specifically for roads. Um, and it will target either $500,000 of, of annual spend or $800,000 of annual spend. Um, if it's the 500, that would be the gap between the 500 that you know we're currently providing, 300 from us, 200 from the state, plus another 500 in the form of this new, new tax and stabilization fund would get us to the million dollars required to fund roads. Um, that would fill the gap. It doesn't. It did, doesn't provide any relief to to you know to, to the capital stables the regular way capital process, which we right now is burdened by roads. Um, if they go with the eight hundred number, then we could back out of you know our our current three hundred thousand dollars a year of of, of funding um, out of the levy, fund it entirely through this new tax, which would free up some capacity you know to to deal with other things. Um, so those are the two options there. Um, there's also a, a, there's also a, a discussion about the very significant amount of um, uh, funding requirements for maintenance and repairs at the schools in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, the big ticket items obviously are, are roofs, HVAC systems, and windows. Um, all these buildings are you know 20 plus years since their last um, renovation, and somewhere between 20 and 30 years, all that stuff you know, needs to be replaced. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're big, big items that aren't going to fit in, in capital. Um, so there's a discussion about creating a special tax, um, and a special purpose stabilization fund, uh, to, you know, to, to fund school repairs and, and, uh, and maintenance to the tune of $1.5 million per year. That's a number I've never heard before, but I heard it last night for the first time. Um, and then finally, there's a discussion about um, a debt exclusion to fund the, uh, the fields and courts. Um, so, you know, really an entire redo of the tennis courts, um, consistent with where we landed at the end of last week, which is, you know, six courts, not, not six plus, plus, you know, two, two pickle or three pickles. Um, and then also to turn the uh, Deer Hill School field you know, into a, uh, you know, into a qualifying competition field, which, you know, right now it's neither level nor the appropriate size. Um, so the idea there would be that that would be, you know, a, 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 a bonding of that. And, um, you know, there would be excluded, you know, an excluded debt charge that would hit the taxpayers. You add all this up and it's, it's, you know, just rough and, you know, really rough math. It's, you know, those, those items together, at least from the back of my envelope, you know, came out to a little bit more than a thousand dollars per the for, per year for the median, you know, the, the median household in uh, 
in Cohasset. So those are the headlights. I, headlines. I don't want to sort of go into this in, in depth tonight because uh, I part because we're out of time. But I, I want people to hear about this so that you can start thinking about it. We can take it up in more detail next week. And if you have any desire to watch, you know, advisory or select board discuss those things, I think it's probably back on the select board agenda next Tuesday. Would be my my guess. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to need to uh, to jump in one minute or late for advisory. Hopefully, they're running late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anything else that we need to, to, to touch on before we adjourn? All good. Okay. I'd entertain a motion. I will move that we adjourn. We have a second. I second. All right. Let's roll call vote this. Uh, Ralph. Uh, Ralph Domus or I. Susan Franklin. Susan Franklin, I. Mike. Mike Dick, I. Francine. Francine Lyons, I. And Brian Host, die. We are now adjourned. The time is seven seventeen. And uh, thank you, everyone. And Michael and anyone else that wants to join me at advisory, you're, you're welcome to. Great. Thank you. Thank Good you. night.